um, request from the floor for any other observations or interventions on Clause 20. Not seeing any, I will move then to Part 7, National Vending Committee, Clause 21. Deputy Chief, floor is yours. Chair, um, this Clause 21 deals with the establishment of the National Vending Committee. So the, the clause speaks to the establishment, but then also speaks to um, the citation of the sixth schedule to deal with the members of the committee and um, other procedures relating to the committee. So if uh, we go to the sixth schedule. <coughs> This is on page 64 for those who are going by pages. All right. Um, as you can see, the constitution of the committee um, is set out. Um, you will note from the note that was submitted to the committee that um, there was an insertion of a representative of the Ministry of Responsible for Tourism. Um, so in the draft that would have been submitted with the amendments arising out of the last meeting, that insertion would have been made. But as you can see, all the members are set out. Um, minister can um, appoint a chairperson. It deals with tenure, resignation, publication, procedure for meetings, um, and remuneration. Um, so if there are any submissions to be made in relation to Clause 21, opening the floor. Thank you. Colleagues, are there any interventions sought under Clause 21? If not, we'll move to Clause 22, which gives you an opportunity to have... Ms. Mr. Chairman? Ah, yes, Dr. Again, again, I'm conscious that um, you may not have seen the raised hand. No, I apologize. <clears throat> Please proceed. Floor is yours. Noted. Thank, thank you, sir. I am reviewing the sixth schedule, the composition of the... Uh, uh, committee and uh, whereas I quite agree with the addition of the Ministry of Tourism, I know Chair that there is also a trade association that is missing from this list that from my recollection has um, in excess of a hundred of its members that have vendors um, and so as we have the um, association of Bayside vendors and Barbin, I would wish to make a submission sir that this association um, known as the Small Business Association of Barbados be considered by the committee as well for inclusion on this um, national vending committee. Noted. <clears throat> any, any views on that, colleagues? Mr. Combat, you want to floor? Um, sure. Yeah, I think that the SBA plays a very important role in the ecosystem, and I have no difficulty with including them as a member of the committee. Fine. Thank you. <coughs> Minister Gudenegel. Thank you, Chair. Um, not on that point specifically, but dealing with the schedule. Uh, I just wanted to understand at G and H, you have um, the manager of markets, and then you have the senior manager of markets, and I recognize that the last count, there were 16 persons on the committee, plus if we add the SBA, there's 17. <coughs> but I would like to understand why we need to have uh, the manager of markets and the senior manager of markets at G&H. So the, the Thanks, cha sir. <coughs> the challenge is, Minister, that the, the manager of markets, if I recall correctly, is a creature under the, or the office, rather, is a creature under the um, Ministry of Art Culture, whereas the Senior Manager Markets Office 
is created under the Ministry of Fisheries. And that, that creates that challenge for us. Understood, Chair. But perhaps then, Chair, um, just out of clarity, for clarity, I think mm -hmm. we should probably um, make the point here is manager markets, if it's uh, uh, fisheries or senior manager markets and the, and the ministry associated with that post. So that we don't get confused, so that another person will do the same thing I'm doing and ask the question. Right. Chair, <coughs> yes. just in relation to the clause two, which speaks to the definitions, the manager of markets is defined and the senior manager of markets is defined. Oh, it is done earlier in the act. That's your point? That's your... your, your yes, Chair. So <coughs> that it is made clear what the, the portfolio of the manager of markets would be and the portfolio of the senior manager of markets. And the senior manager of markets is especially included be, to, to deal with the fish markets. Thank you. You said that that is to be found at clause two of the bill? Yes, Chair. Right. In the definition, definition section. Mr. Mr. Chair, could you be gracious and accommodating enough to allow me to go back to section, go back to part five, um, clause 18, um, sub subsection e, E3 that speaks to uh, e, not E3, E1. I, I just hope that we have some clarity on this term, insulting gestures. Um, I hope that we can at least break that down so that we have a clear understanding of what it is that we want to address by insulting gestures. Um, <coughs> what, what is accepted by one set of people as insulting gestures might be just a normal way. I, I will tell you why. Um, I've had a uh, had the experience of a young lady who was dismissed from a government institution once um, um, because after having conversation with management the lady walked away swaying her hips and the management interpret that to be indifferent figure that um, she showed no respect for management and because the per because the nature the nature of the employment uh, no the physic <laughs> the physic the physic was extremely rhythmic and um, she the, the management was offended and decided that um, she, she, she would dismiss her from the job so if the, this is a bit wide and it gives some comfort to people who think of that specific way. Chair, so I hope you just, just to indicate Sorry. that in the Public Order Act, it speaks to abusive, insulting words or behavior. Behavior would be larger than gestures. Um, the, so there are, are different wording that would be used um, throughout um, legislation, and they're normal within the within the um, statute book. Thank you. Most legislation, when we have things that sound a bit abstract, um, the legislation normally states, um, um, for the purpose of this act, such a term or such a word is described as such in many um, areas of modern legislation when you have something that is so expansive there's a clear there's a clear indication in the app that you give it a clear definition to see how it relates um, or only if it is uh, only if there's established judicial precedent that you can rely on the precedent and apply it to the, the actual legislation itself I don't know, just, just suggesting that. Uh, you're the expert, um, but I'm suggesting that, uh, that we be very clear on what this 
this attempt to capture body language that is good and body language that is bad, what it is that you intend to, to have. In modern times, we are seeing young people doing so, and sometimes when they say so, we're in agreement. Sometimes when they do it in this way, right? You, you can interpret that to suit you. And if, if an employee talks to somebody, boy, do so, do so and come up slow, it is one thing to come and do so and push it forward, so it's a different <laughs> thing. So I just said, this, these things, um, it's different if a man talking to a manager and he takes off his spot so he turn around. Well, I, I, I believe that's, that might be interpreted as some level of obscene, obscene or form of indecency or something like that. But these new terms that we see being introduced into law, um, even people that understand the, the English language well, and I certainly don't purport to be one, um, but we, we, we know that that's, those terms are a bit too extensive. It's just a small point that I just saw, and I, I just figured that we can, we can think about it and at least be very, very clear, or at least in some area where we clearly um, defining language according to the act itself. Um, we, we put it, we have a provision in there that says this is what it really means. So that ordinary people can understand it as well as lawyers as well. Mr. Bell, do you feel particularly strong, strongly on the question of gestures? I, I know Chair, you, you, you can, you that. can, Chair, you can change it to behavior, but for instance, in the Public Order Act, it's actually an offense. In this, in this act, it's basically subject to um, an administrative penalty. So the thing is that, to me, the gesture is lower than behavior. You can put in behavior, um, and that will... Insulting you, behavior? Yes, because you have... It says insulting you, in, the, in the public so, order So in the public order, act, it start, speaks about threatening, abusive, or insulting words or behavior. Then maybe we should emulate the language of the Public Order Act. Now, if I could go back then, um, colleagues, to the, <clears throat> the sixth schedule um, to directly treat to Dr. Holder's um, point. I don't think there's any objection to the Small Business Association being named. I do, however, also feel, Ms. Bell, that even though we have, we have um, defined this matter of manager markets and senior manager markets in the legislation, it, it may be useful for the avoidance of doubt to find a form of words, even if it only takes us back to the original um, Chair, um, that, that would be cumbersome and against... I know. Yeah, and I, 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 I think <coughs> that when there are conventions on interpretation of legislation, I mean, it, you, should, you should observe them. That is why you put the definitions in um, Clause 2, to inform how those expressions are to be interpreted. So I don't think that, that it would be wise. It Thank does you. not look tidy. I agree with you. But I just recognize that this keeps on coming back up repeatedly. Um, Chair, then it, it's, it requires persons to read. That's, that's, <laughs> that's what it requires. I, I'm sorry, but you do have to read. Miss Bell, Miss Bell. <laughs> I'm, sure, I'm sure that you genuinely feel that way. But I, I, I equally am feeling that it might be necessary for us to try to make life a little bit easier for those who, as you put it, have not, have not read fully. Um, kindly reflect on it, on it, if you could come up with a form of words that might be able to, to accommodate G&H without it being overly cumbersome. Um, colleagues, are there any other concerns we have about the sixth schedule? Okay, then we can move to clause 22, which is the <coughs> elaboration uh, upon the functions of the committee. Um, sorry, Senator Wiggins, before we go there, I think I see Senator Wiggins' hand online. Yes, sir. 
Sandra, Sandra, Sandra Pickens here, muted. Probably by the host, not by me. Uh, indeed, I, I, I would not have wanted the host to have muted you, but you're fine there now. Please proceed. Yes, sir. Thank you. I was only saying in uh, relation to the matter just discussed, when you not just put agriculture in brackets next to G and fisheries in brackets next to H. That, that would seem to be very yeah. simple. That would seem to be a very simple solution. I have no difficulty with it. I leave it to Ms. Bell to, to determine. Um, thank you, Senator Biggins. Are there any other requests online or off? No? Fine. Deputy Chief, you have the floor. Clause 22, functions of the committee. Chair, um, so clause 22 goes into the functions of the committee, um, bearing in mind that it's an advisory committee, the, the clause goes into the matters on which the committee will advise. In relation to the Minister responsible for commerce, um, on matters relating to vending policy, it will be the overseeing of the policy, assessing implementation risks, monitoring and evaluating achievement of objectives, ensuring that all government-related entities involved um, and considered their responsibilities, um, preparing annual briefings. B, they speak to the um, advising of the minister responsible for markets and the minister responsible for beaches, esplanades, gardens and parks and also the minister responsible for fisheries on the following, the monitoring and ensuring continued upgrade and maintenance of vending zones, monitoring compliance of vendors in conditions on the vending zones, um, standards adhered to including but, standards to be adhered to by the vendors, um, specifically in relation to personal hygiene, cleanliness, and then also relating to amenities, um, including waste disposal, public toilets, drinking water, protective covers to protect against weather, storage facilities, including stor cool storage, and the aesthetic design of stalls. Colleagues, floor is open. I am seeing Dr. Holden. Um, Mr. Yes, Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. Um, a, a query, again, relative to um, the, the sixth schedule, the constitution of the committee. I am querying, sir, having heard um, Minister Galinagio's intervention earlier, size of the committee. Um, the authors of this bill um, would have envisioned that they needed someone from education, yes, um, technology and vocational training as well, um, recognizing that these three disciplines are all a part of the same ministry. Um, if, it, if it is a case where um, the technocrats, if I can call them that, are of the view that these three need to stand out um, um, independently of, of each other, or is it a case where because of, of current composition of the ministry that we can have one individual uh, representing that ministry and therefore maybe reduce the, the size of the, of the committee? Query through you, Chair, to the... Um, CPC. CPC, floor is yours. The chair, from the discussions that were had in the house, um, for instance, education, they were um, requesting their inclusion in relation to schools. Um, in terms of technology, you wanted them included so that if there are technological um, aspects that could improve the operations for vendors that they would be included um, I don't I can, oh, in terms of vocational training um, I can't remember the the, uh, 
the rationale for that one. But again, I, I think maybe um, Mr. Sorry? So, um, right, so these, ver so, they, so the thing is, is that you want to be able to have representation from these differing voices so that their interests could be um, reflected and, and allow for um, vendors to operate fully. Thank you. Dr. Holder. Yes, yes, Chair, I understand the rationale. Um, in, in light, though, of the reality um, on the ground, I know that um, education and vocational training tend to tend to, to, to be uh, merged within the same ministry. Yes, in the past, we've had technology in another, another space. Um, but given that education and vocational training tend to be um, within the same ministry, um, yes, Chair, we don't know what will happen in the future. Um, how, how will this now be operationalized when um, the ministry is, is so notified in light of how the ministry is composed now, Chair? This may not be a, a question relative to the legal drafting, but in a practical way now, um, I would hope that it's not a case where we're inviting three persons from the same ministry to, to, to serve going forward. No, I, I, um, I had allowed for the Deputy Chief to, to, to voice her view on the matter, but I, I personally think that we, we may be advised best to rethink this replication, especially within the context of the current arrangements. Okay, noted. I, I, am, I am pausing because I, I, am, I am actually reflecting here on it. You're, you're perfectly correct in my view, Dr. Holder, that right now we have three on its face. It would read as though there were three representatives from one ministry. Um, I'm not sure that's what we're trying to achieve. Yes, um, Deputy Chief. I want to say something before Deputy Chief intervenes, sir. Oh, sorry, 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 um, <laughs> Senator Wiggins. Just bear with me, yeah. bear with me. Oh, Mr. Kamabach also wanted the floor. Um, Senator Wiggins first, and then Mr. Kamabach after. Um, Mr. Chairman, I want to say that I totally agree with Dr. Holder, and because of what she said, then because we have the senior manager of markets, then we have a representative of the ministry responsible for fisheries. So that's a duplication there as well. So I just thought I would like to bring that to your attention, sir. And I totally agree with what Dr. Holder said. You only need one representative from the Ministry of Educational, Technological, Vocational, and everything else. You know, I don't think we need to have 10 people representing the same ministry. So the senior manager of markets and who, in this case, is fisheries, then you have a representative of the ministry responsible for fisheries. So that's duplication also. And I think a lot of this duplication has come about because previously these areas were on the separate ministries, or in case of agriculture, it used to be agriculture and fisheries. So now we have agriculture on the one ministry, and fisheries on the maritime. So I think that's where you're getting these um, things mixed up and confused a bit. Chair, just to reiterate yeah. in relation to manager, the inclusion of manager of markets and senior manager of markets, it is not a duplication. The manager of markets has a separate portfolio from the senior manager of markets. The senior manager of markets deals with public markets that are fishing markets. The manager of markets deals with other, an, another portfolio. And as I also explained, these terms are defined in clause two. There was a concession to trying to 
make, um, I suppose, the portfolios clear here in the schedule if people don't really want to read um, from clause two. But um, otherwise, that is not that is not a that is not a duplication. In relation to the other matters, I I must raise a flag in relation to the inclusion of vocational training, technology education. They were highlighted in the meetings that we had prior to this bill being introduced as persons who have a stake in the matter. Um, and I pointed out the reasons for education and for technology. I could not remember the vocational training, but I think that we should invite the opinion of the of Mr. Cumberbatch from the Ministry in relation to the inclusion. Thank you. Thank you very much. And Mr. Cumberbatch, the floor is yours. Yes, Chair. Um, when the issue of the vending committee was, was first discussed, um, and looking at what has, has resulted here, I think that there may be a case for the combining of vocational training and education. And, and therefore have one ministry representing both. But as it relates to technology, uh, my understanding is that the thinking was um, that this person should come from the Ministry of Innovation, Science and Smart Technology. Sorry, no, I was saying that there may be a case for combining the representative for vocational training and education, I think two of those could be combined. But as it relates to the person responsible for technology, I, my understanding is that the thinking was that person should be coming from the Ministry of Innovation, Science, or Smart Technology. Understood. So, <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman. And then, Mr. The, the, then there's another part, um, duplication here at M a representative of the ministry responsible for fisheries. I think at the time that we were perhaps looking at the fish landing sites, um, but we also have somebody from the, we also have the senior manager of markets, which is from the same ministry, I, I believe, um, Minister Humphrey. Yeah. Chair, right. again, so, again, so that sorry, is I, I have to, to intervene. That is not a duplication. Ministry responsible for from fisheries is to deal with the fish landing the sites. Site, yeah. They um, right, and so they have to be represented from that perspective. And then, um, senior manager of markets for fish markets, right? Specifically, those are the delineations. Minister Free, you, you have a view? Uh, the deputy CPC is absolutely correct. As it stands, the fisheries, uh, the ministry responsible for fisheries here is for the fish landing sites, and the senior manager of markets is for markets. But given the, the size of the, the committee, I, I think we could, as a ministry, make one representation and it would be on us to, to meet probably before the committee meets, so as to reduce the size, but not to say there is duplication, but given that we are one ministry, I believe that we could undertake to do the necessary consultation before the meeting so that the person representing the ministry can speak with some authority on both areas. So, Chair, um, there is no duplication. I'll, I reiterate that. No, I understand okay? what you're saying. But okay, well, um, what I, I, was I, I was going to say to you that my understanding of what Minister Humphrey is, is suggesting is that we can, in the interest of trying to make the committee a little bit smaller and hopefully, therefore, more manageable, um, the representative for the ministry responsible for fisheries can be taken out and uh, at the level of the senior manager of markets, the necessary consultations will be done across the fisheries division. Chair, I am weary um, in relation to, to that, because um, I don't know 
the extent to which the senior manager of markets deals with the fish landing sites. Um, I thought that it would have gone the other way where you invite a ministry, a representative of the ministry responsible for fisheries and then what would happen is you take out the senior manager of markets and then you would do a consultation to see which person, which representative should go then. Should the chair understand the concern, but the markets are by far more numerous um, than there are landing sites. In terms of the people we have, so the active landing sites now where we have vendors will be Pile Bay. Um, we have, really it's Pile Bay and Pile Bay. The others, we have other landing sites, but they're not really, they don't really have personnel. So we would have more markets needing representation and I, I, I believe given the fact that we meet so often that the senior manager markets could have, but I take your point, uh, C if that be CPC, but I believe that we could have conversation and that the senior manager markets could make the necessary representation. I do agree that the committee is too big and some, um, that it is big and that some, some compromise has to be made. So that, um, that's what I'm suggesting, not that there's any duplication because there is none. But I'm suggesting in the interest of the, the function of the committee that the senior manager markets would then have to do the consultation in-house before he comes to this this meeting, I the chief fish, uh, chief fish Reserve officer were here, she might disagree with me, to be honest. But um, she, but I think the necessary consultation can be done in house. I think. And I think that having heard the the the, the minister responsible, far be it from any of us to supersede that. Chair, just for clarity, um, who are we including? Senior manager, Just senior manager of markets. Okay, thank you. Okay, now, um, one second, please. Okay. Um, with the colleagues online who are not speaking, or when you're not speaking, kindly remember to mute your mics. The, the, you're not a, you're not you're not running afoul of that requirement at this moment, but apparently it had been an issue at some point. Now, um, Mr. Cumberbatch, with respect to the thinking about the constitution of the committee. I am hearing it being repeatedly stated that the committee seems to be on the larger side. Are there any strong feelings that, that, you, that were held in the early stages of the work on this matter about which you might be aware um, with respect to the, the size of the committee? What, 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 is, what was being intended? Well, initially the size of the committee um, was more a matter of um, having the wider consultation. Um, but in relation to the legislation, to my mind, I, I, I'm still of the view that it's a little, it's a little bit large. Um, so where they could be trimming, and perhaps, I don't know if you would want to establish um, because you may have a committee and then you may invite persons to make the submissions before the committee. Perhaps such an arrangement could be made. Um, so there may be a little trimming where, where, that could be, where that could be done, but then we can still invite the views of, of other persons to, to give their submissions. Okay, can I ask then that you, sir, please just give some time, some time give this some thought as to how we might restructure the, the um, or have a recommendation from you on how we might relook the constitution of this committee. Um, it may or may not pass the, 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 the parliamentary subcommittee, but I think that we would do well to give this a little bit of thought as we go forward, because Chair. adding to it today as we just did, it would then become almost 20 members. Oh. Yeah, Chair, just to, to um, remind 
the committee also that this particular committee is advisory and there are, and right so it is basically to collate as many of the stakeholders as possible in one place so we do have to t be cognizant of that when we are determining the number and doing our trimming as you say thank you okay i'm guided thank you um i have one observation i would like to draw to your attention and that is that <clears throat> on with respect to clause 22 subclause b it says the minister responsible for public markets the minister responsible for beaches esplanades gardens and parks and the minister responsible for fisheries will be advised by the committee on a number of things i think that the minister responsible for commerce should be involved in that it should be one of those people who are advised as well I, I, I think that because the policy resides largely in the Commerce um, Ministry, that issues relating to monitoring and ensuring the upgrade and maintenance of the vending zones, compliance of vendors, the conditions under which they are functioning, etc., I think those are things that the Ministry, with the broader policy responsibility, needs to benefit from advice on. So, Chair, this will be... Um Okay, so in clause 22A, we have the minister responsible for commerce mm -hmm. on matters relating to the national vending policy. Mm -hmm. So we have those, and then you want, and then what would be recommended is then the minister responsible for commerce also be added to B. Yes. In spite of the A. Yes. Yes. Okay. Thank you. For the avoidance of doubt. In other words, as you go deep into the belly of, of the provisions of subclause B, you're getting into things like waste disposal and uh, sanitation matters and so on, protective covers, etc., etc. Things that might not always be top of mind in the Commerce Division, but do impact the policy. Uh, man not Madam Chair, Chairman, sir, sorry. I don't mind being called by the wrong title. For example, I've heard president, etc. But if you're going to say madam, I'm going to have strenuous difficulties I'm with so that. Sorry, sir. Normally, in this place, in this place, when I say chair, it's normally madam chair. I apologize. But I, I saw the hesitancy in the, the in the deputy CPC, and I am now inclined to agree that perhaps we should then, give, given what you just said, take out senior manager markets and leave a representative of the ministry responsible for fisheries, which would also include senior manager markets if necessary. Because it seems there are wider issues that would also be consulted on here. So I would remove H and leave M. No, I, 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 I want to just say this though. The reason why I just want members to re recall, Minister Ford is not with us at the point, but the, one of the concerns we had with respect to the supervisor markets and the senior management of markets was this question of the evictions, relocations, that day-to-day -day management of the process. And I, I, yes, because there's nobody else who can really speak to those issues outside of the senior manager. That's what I'm saying. I mean, given the committee, because the representative of the ministry responsible for fisheries would still be on my recommendation, the, manager, the senior manager of markets. But in the instance where there are wider considerations, I just heard you speaking about other things, um, it would be, I think, in the ministry's interest to have a, a lens that's zoomed out somewhat. Um, so that the representative of the ministry responsible for fisheries would more than likely be the senior manager of markets. The, the, the challenge doesn't arise in the Ministry of Agriculture because they don't have two instances of markets. Where I have markets and I have landing sites, they just have one. So their manager of markets is going to cover everything they need. In my instance, I have markets and I also have fish landing sites, um, which would all both require some consultation. But if they're advising the minister responsible for fisheries, I think it wouldn't hurt to zoom out somewhat. Because in my, it, the representative responsible for fisheries would be the senior manager of markets. If we were to do it the other way around, it would mean that I could have no other person other than the senior manager of markets 
and nobody else in fisheries. But I suppose it's somewhat intellectual. May I request, may I suggest then, Minister, that much like Mr. Kamabach, that you two give some thought to this, and we can always be advised as to what your yes, sir. your formal position is. Yes, but sir. colleagues, it may well be that even though this committee at first blush does appear to be very sizable, for the, 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 the practical purposes that we've all been pointing to, it may be um, impossible to get the benefit of wide consultation and advice, and at the same time not maintain the size of it. So. Well, yes, and, and as, as, as the clerk of the House makes the point, there's really no inherent problem with having a large committee. Um, okay, are there any other observations sought or interventions sought on 22? If not, we go to into clause 23, please. Appeals, part um, 8. Uh, 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 Mr. Chair, I just want, to, just want some clarity. I don't know exactly which part of provisions such as this um, but I think it um, should be placed. But I believe that there's a major conflict that the state is failing to address while giving the impression to both Maritime and to the NCC that they have any right absolutely to control um, vending on beaches. Private sector is claiming under a convention called accretion that they have rights, conventional rights, to ex extended right down to the high water mark on the beaches. And when NCC or any of the government agencies attempt to assert themselves, they are laying claims under this so-called term accretion to private ownership of the lands extended down to the high water mark. Therefore, when the NCC um, enter into an arrangement with a vendor to put chairs on certain areas on the beach, the private sector is saying, no, this is our property. In some cases, the private sector puts chairs and block off the entire beach and obstruct people on the beaches and they're arguing that they don't have to have the approval of an institution that is, pro that is protected on the statute and allowing a convention to overrule statutory law. And I believe at some point, I don't, I don't think it's a matter that can be easily resolved here, but I think that the luminaries, um, the academics, or whoever, we ought to address these issues because sometimes I get the impression we are withdrawing from facing some realities because of a fear and believing that we're going to disrupt the order. So I would, like to, I would like to know if it is the view of the, those who are responsible for drafting um, of giving some clarity to the authorities of the state, which is in this case Martin Affairs, NCC, Coastal, and those beach lands, if it is clear that where the Martin Affairs or where NCC has the legal authority, that conventional practice must play a secondary role to the legal authority that is vested in the three state agencies' hands. I think is a matter, um, I'm not talking about coconut trees now, but I think it's a matter that we have to address because we have that problem now. All the coastal lands, especially with people putting up chairs, and then the only body that NCC can assert themselves and deal with is small people. But when big people do the same thing and abuse the law, they can continue to do it because the state backs off and allow them to do what they want to do. So I would like to believe that we will have some discussion at some point, and I don't know if in the property law or if it's in the law related to vending, we need to address these issues, but I think it is something that we should consider. Chair, but it's an issue with the state. In relation to the original presentation that was made, um, under clause five, six, 
it was made, sorry? Oh, sorry, it was made clear that um, a person carrying on a hotel, restaurant, or other business in respect of which there is an existence of a valid liquor license that they would be required to apply for a vending license under the, the present legislation and they would be applying to the NCC. This is a present, the preservation of a power that was once under the NCC Act. So that area has been addressed. Thank you. This is in relation to a liquor license? I oh, chair, chair, oh? chair, chair, just uh, to be clear. We imported what was under the NCC Act and put it in this piece of legislation so that the NCC would have the authority to deal with hotels um, that carry on their, their business um, near the beaches and, uh, and other, th other areas that are covered by, were covered by the NCC in relation to vending. But there was the other part in relation to the liquor licenses that we also had to, uh, were asked to preserve, which we did. So I am just saying that there was an active preservation of the NCC's powers in relation to these entities. Thank you. All I'm saying is that at present, there is a wide complaint on our beaches by persons who are asking for permission to carry on a business, having chairs on the beaches. They apply to the NCC. The NCC grants permission, but lots of the people in the private sector who owns beachfront land don't believe that they have a duty also to apply to NCC for, to ask for permission to place beach chairs on the lands adjacent to their property that is extended down to the high water mark which is classified as um, accretion. I'm just saying that to me, it seems as though the preferential treatment, that is the general discussion on the beaches by ordinary people. And I'm just asking if this legislation is the appropriate legislation that we can use to address such a problem. I don't, I'm not trying to make things complicated. I'm just asking if you can resolve it because it has happened more than once while I was minister. I had, before that as well, I had to venture to the beach where business people decide this is my area of land. Men came out with loudspeakers and said, this is my area of land and I don't have to ask NCC for any permission and they told people who were in their restaurant, you can't enter back in here as long as you deal with vendors on the outside. I don't, they don't have the authority. And I just saying that we need to address it. Mm. I'm not saying that you must address it in this piece of legislation. I, I, I you but I just need member. clarity, on, but we have to address it. I follow Chair. you, Honorable Member, and I, I would want to suggest to you that perhaps the better piece of legislation will be the National Conservation Commission Act. No, Chair, Chair, sorry. sorry. I, I really do have to intervene. Again, that part that gave the NCC that authority was transferred into this legislation. And I s went through pains to explain how it was incorporated. And so I am saying that I have provided the response that is required. It, the legislation provides for the enforcement mechanism and the obligation has been created and the power to regulate has been created. So I am not really sure what is the issue. Thank you. If this right exists, does it exclude the claim that is being made currently 
about the right to accretion? Is it on the general principle of statute, statutory law preponderates any kind of conventional practice? And therefore, it stands. I'm just trying to find out that because we are not writing narratives uh, here about uh, fiction. Uh, uh, and what I, what I very humbly would wish to draw to your attention, <coughs> and indeed to remind the Deputy Chief Parliamentary Counsel, is that the vendor's bill does not, in any way, shape, or form, begin to address the issue of accretion, nor should it be taken to the extent that it will address those issues. Okay or any derivative thereof. I think if we keep this within the, as we like to say in Barbados, you hold your lane. Let's, let's keep our lane. We make it very simple and easy to every, for everybody to understand. No doubt, Honorable Member for St. Michael East, you're raising substantive issues that do in fact exist, but they will not be fixed in this piece of legislation. Okay. Understood, sir. Okay. Now can we move to part eight, please? Appeals uh, Clause 23. <laughs> Chair, uh, Clause 23 speaks to the grounds for appeal and a person who is aggrieved by a decision of the Minister, a decision of the Commission or a decision of the Manager of, Mark of Bending Zones may apply and they, are, they have there are the specifications for um, the grounds for which they can apply. Um, so that is basically the substance of that provision. Um, comments. Okay. Colleagues? I'm not seeing any request for an intervention. As they say, going, going, gone. Um, please then, can we proceed then to Clause 24? Chair, Sorry. Clause 24. Sorry. Go ahead, go ahead. Clause 24 speaks to the establishment of the National Vending Appeals Tribunal. Um, it speaks to the composition, uh, the tenure, in terms of um, appointment and reappointment, and re remuneration. Comments? Colleagues, any issues relating to the establishment of a National Vending Appeals Tribunal? We have the composition of the tribunal, we have the tenure, um, we have to lead the opposition on the floor. Please proceed. As a query, I don't see it in 24. I know it follows in the where. Um, is there any provision stipulated here um, with respect to a time frame within which the National Venom Appeals Tribunal should meet and dispatch or dispense with matters before it? Ask that against the backdrop of what no obtains where people with um, industrial relations problems uh, can't get the matters uh, resolved in good time. Tribunal is not meeting here, all kinds of excuse explanations. There's no facility um, wherein we can meet um, this and the next. And delays and protracted delays and people's matters are not heard to the, to the significant disadvantage. Are we going to repeat this? Uh, you will not bring that kind of situation to to um, obtain with reference to this matter, I'm sure, Minister, but what undertaking assurance there is, if we fall short of a guarantee, what assurance is there that appeals will be disposed of in good time, such as not to disadvantage people we're trying to empower? I take the point, Lady the Opposition. I think that this would be a matter that would have to be dealt with in by way of regulations to the, to the legislation. I Chair? don't know that it could tightly be dealt with here. I yes. hear the CPC on it. Please proceed. Chair, Chair just to say that in Clause 23, um, the persons who are grieved um, in relation to the decision of the various functionaries may, within 14 days of the receipt of the notice of the decision, appeal to the tribunal. So that is the 
um, one of the timelines stated, as you um, would have um, articulated, the general procedure um, may have to be fleshed out in regulations and um, the power has been given for the minister to do so. Right. I see that, Mr. Chair, with your leave, but um, that's, that's the time frame within which one can give notice or make an appeal, but to have the matter disposed of becomes another issue. Uh, and it is to that that I was, yeah. I was speaking. Um, and I think the CPC is also pointing you in that direction that I think it is clause 37 of the bill allows the minister to make regulations and quite, quite rightly what you are seeking is a provision, sorry, not 37, clause 34. Um, and what you are seeking is a provision which will facilitate um, a, a finite and defined time frame within which these appeals are administered. <laughs> uh, I just want to make another point. Um, sir, this, this thing about restricting people from in the tribunal um, from being a participant if they have less than 10 years experience. Um, it is strange that a, a person who, with, all the, with a specialty, have been an outstanding scholar in this specific area, will have to wait 10 years be, be, before he is perceived as qualified to serve on a tribunal. There are some people that spend 10 years in service and never reach the level of some person that spent 10 months in the service. I would like to see an area where, where, where uh, a person has the appropriate specialty um, that they can qualify on merit. Um, not 10 years <laughs> don't necessarily mean that is based on the judgment of meritocracy. Um, you can be in 10 years, 20 years, 40 years, and you still can't perform at the level or still can't even understand the complexity of some of the public issues that like you to come before us. And at least there, there must be somewhere, I mean, something else that we can do. But if a man comes in, he's well qualified, and we know that he's well qualified, there are always ways of finding out if he's well qualified to apply the appropriate judgment and understanding to these things. That he should not be debarred from participating because he does not have 10 years of experience. I remember I would be the last person to have a challenge with meritocracy, but I think you would appreciate that. Even as the legislation speaks to an attorney at law of 10 years standing, what the attorney is being asked to demonstrate, hopefully, by that 10 years period of time, is that he, has a comp he or she has, a comp um, has developed some level of experience and expertise. Equally, with the vendor of at least 10 years of experience, one is hoping that you become familiar with the business of vending in all of its shapes and forms across the island. If there was a more objective standard to be offered, um, I would be happy to hear it. But in the absence of that, what do we do? Um, while you mull over that answer, let me hear, let me hear um, Senator Sands, please. All right, dealing with the same point, Chair. Um, while I understand the point, as you just related with the attorney at law for the 10 years, um, my difficulty here, and I guess Deputy CPC can assist me here, um, when we deal with subsection 2B, set clause 2B, a vendor of at least 10 years experience, how exactly do we measure 10 years experience? Because by definition, a vendor is a person who has a license. By the definition, it would, we would be determined, we would be assessing a vendor as a person who has a license. So would the 10 years be based on 10 years continuous, continuous holding of that license? Is that what we determine to be 10 years experience? Because we're, we're narrowing back to the, the definition of what is a vendor. And if we check the description of a vendor, a vendor is a person who has a license, as opposed to just a person who has been in the practice of vending over 10 years of time and now has a license, and we're assessing them not necessarily based at the point at which they receive the license, but based on the overall time they have been in the, the practice of vending. 
to, that is my, my, my concern as to how do we measure 10 years experience. So I guess that the CPC could give me some guidance there. Thank Chair, you. it was really supposed to be um, assessed based on your practice as a vendor. So that was the thinking. Um, but I understand what is being pointed out. It is just now how do you um, get the, the person with the requisite experience, how do you reflect that? So then the thing is that I would need some kind of policy directive in order to, um, for you to attract the right type of person to be sitting in this, in this chair. Thanks. Chair, um, if we look at C, a person with knowledge and experience in business of vending and the operation of markets, would not also overlap them with the same a vendor of 10 years experience? We Point here. Question asked and answered. Indeed, Chair. Good. Go ahead, um, Ms. Moore. Chair, Chair, we didn't have the pleasure of hearing. Oh, I beg your pardon, um, um, Senator Holder. Uh, the, 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 the observation was that a person with knowledge and experience in the business of vending may not necessarily be a vendor. And so therefore, the, the difficulty of a potential overlap doesn't necessarily arise. Um, Chair, my, my mind was just going to the Employment Rights Act, for instance, where a tribunal is established where you have an attorney, you have an employer's representative, you have an employee's representative. And I'm wondering if the way to get around B is to suggest that the person is selected from among the vendors, like Barvin or, or, or whatever the association, other associations may be agreed, and that may come up from time to time, if they get to choose their own person to sit on the tribunal, because that's how it is done, and it is effective in, in other areas of the legislation. So without stipulating, because certainly an association would choose from among the best that they, they believe exists to, to represent them. So I'm just wondering if that's not something that we can look at. Or so one hopes. Um, the suggestion... Agreed, agreed, agreed. Uh, um, the suggestion then, Honorable Member for St. Michael East, is that we could have 24-2B replaced by a vendor selected or chosen by the um, Barbados Association of Vendors. Chair, just a, ooh, sorry, uh, uh, in an organization um, which represents vendors, make it more oh, general. Oh, sorry, yeah. an organization represent, yeah. No, the only danger there is that they are there are a plurality of organizations representing vendors, so how do we determine which organization is the one that will do so? I, I, I don't know that such a thing exists. I, I don't know. It is, it is, I, I'm hearing you, but I, I am being, I, I am being very serious about it. I do not know that that is possible given the lay of the land at the moment because of the very informal nature of the, the whole business. According to the draft though, um, what was before us, a vendor of at least 10 years experience, who was doing the selection in any case? Where was this person, how was this person to be decided by who? Chair, the min minister was supposed to do the um, appointment, so um, that is how that is how it would be done. Um, this is appointed by the minister, correct? Yeah. 
So the minister in his discretion was going, what, what the proposal would have been for the minister in his discretion to determine um, or appoint a vendor of 10 years experience. Going back to the, um, Senator Sanz's um, question, it would have been a vendor who has been holding a license for 10 years at least. Now, the, the issue is if we are going to depart from that line of thinking, I have no difficulty with that, but let us not make it unduly cumbersome. If we are going to have it as a representative of a, an association of vendors, I think we have to choose the association or find a way of making sure that the association is representative of the the broad community of vending, which at present seems to be difficult. Now, I'm quite happy for this to be a matter that we put before the vending community when they come to give evidence. Because you have bar vending, you have them at CND, right? Under the Constitutional Committee's Association of Website Vendors, we have them listed. And we have the Barbados Association of Vendors, Retailers, and Entrepreneurs. So I think you're right, Chair, that that could be a matter that's discussed with them. I, don't, I personally don't like the idea of any minister determining for vendors who will represent them on a tribunal. The minister shouldn't like it either. The minister has listened to the honorable member's tone and is, is properly schooled. Um, no, schooled and scolded. Um, I see Senator Holder's hand. Oh, yeah, thanks, Sherry. I actually was just about to, re to lower it um, because the last intervention by Envy Moore is actually what I wanted to um, suggest. I know, um, Chair, that from your experience over the last year and some, in the sector, you're, you're, you're aware that this is a challenging undertaking. Um, unlike the example given by MP Moore with the Employment Rights Tribunal, those agencies are well structured, good governance arrangements in place, etc. So, you know, you don't really have a challenge if you're very practical. Um, there's a high level of informality in the vending sector, um, and so that could easily be a challenge. Um, so, so, Mr. Chairman, I understand your your concerns, um, but you know, it would be interesting to see if we're able to get the well, the two because there 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 are many two that represent the majority, if you will. Um, if we can get them to to agree on who that person should be, failing that uh, minister. Simmons, with responsibility for commerce, may have to make a decision. Yes, we don't like a minister appointing persons to the tribunal, but in, in, in a case like this, if we are unable to um, draw on another model, we may have, sir, to look at 2B as a person with 10 years, at least 10 years, bending experience. Mm. I you noted, um, Senator Holder. Um, the challenge really would be how do you, 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 you form, formulate that view into... Uh, look, before we go there, let us do ourselves, give ourselves the benefit of having the consultation on this point with the, the, the community. Um, that way we will be able to question them, get an understanding of how structured they really are, um, what their thoughts on the proposal are. I think we do ourselves a lot of good if we just defer this particular point until when we've had an opportunity to have it more appropriately ventilated, more fully ventilated. Is that agreed? Fine. Um, Senator Cummins, did you want the floor? Sorry, Minister Cummins. Is Minister Cummins there? She's gone. She's online but does not appear to be um, with us at this time. Okay, we will go then to Clause 25. 
Chair Clause 25 um, allows for the suspension of decisions of the various functionaries, being the Minister, the Commission, the Manager of Vending Zones, um, pending the appeal under um, Clause 23 on application of the appellant and suspend the operation of the decision until the appeal is determined. Colleagues, this is not a difficult clause. This clause effectively is, is saying that if you are uh, minded to appeal the decision made by the minister, the commission, or the manager of vending zones from against whom you are appealing, those decisions are stayed until or suspended rather until the appeal is determined. Any issues with that? None. I proceed to clause number 26. Power of the Tribunal, Deputy CPC. Clause 26 deals with the powers of the tribunal. Um, so you will see that there are interventions that can be made um, in relation to changing of decisions or directing of um, certain actions um, in relation to the decision. Um, you can allow certain appeals, dismiss certain appeals, confirm certain decisions. Um, in relation to compensation, you can set aside an amount or and substitute for an amount of compensation. So there are a number of powers that um, the tribunal has pursuant to this clause. So if, they, if there are comments, I'm obliged. Colleagues, um, are there any interventions being sought under this clause? And then? Here, um, clause 27 gives the power of a party to appeal um, the decision of the tribunal um, on a point of law to the high court. So that's basically clause 27. Colleagues, appeal to the High Court. Honorable Member for St. Michael East, appeal to the High Court. Correct practice needs to be followed on at this point. Yes. Uh, after the tribunal made the next, the next um, caucus that is appropriate is the High Court. Fine. No issues? No issues. Okay. Okay, we move then to part nine. If I am not seeing any other uh, requests for the floor. Part nine, administrative penalties. Uh, clause 28 speaks to um, just a general provision on administrative penalties. So where a person contravenes a provision as set out in part one of the seventh schedule, um, they would be liable to pay the manager of vending zones a penalty, an administrative penalty as set out um, in the seventh schedule. Any requests for the floor? Okay, clause 29. Clause 29 requires the manager of vending zones to issue an administrative penalty notice if they find that there's a contravention. Um, the nature of the, well, the form of the notice is set out in the seventh schedule. Um, the notice will specify the nature of the act, the penalty to be paid, and um, it will be a requirement to pay the penalty within 14 days of the date of the notice. Um, a person who is in receipt of the admin penalty notice um, shall pay the amount of the penalty um, set in the notice on or before the date specified in the notice. Do 
that, that, that is clause 29, subclause 1 through 3. Colleagues, any issues, or can we go to clause 30? That's true, that's a Senator query. Senator Sands. Um, I don't know if it would be appropriate for, for clause 29, but while I know that the person would be asked to pay a penalty, um, is it possible within the law that in circumstances where a person is unable to pay the penalty in full, that there could be provisions for uh, a payment, not necessarily a payment plan for lack of a better word, but somewhere that you can indicate within the law that there can be a structured payment settlement that would be open to the vendor to negotiate with the, the manager of vendors. So in other words, if I can't pay the full amount of the penalty by the specific date, is there a way that through the law I would be able to pay over a period of time so that I am not in breach of the, the penalty? That's my query. You wish to take a reply, CPC? Chair, a provision can be inserted to give um, that kind of a discretion. I personally have no objection to such a provision being inserted. I think it would be humane in keeping with the spirit of the legislation. Um, in these matters, I'd like to defer to the, to the views of the Honorable Member for St. Michael East. I don't know if he wishes to go on the record on this issue. No, no, no. Mr. Chair, you are correct. Um, I always believe that when we structure legislation, um, we structure legislation knowing very well the category of individuals, the class of individuals, the social standard of individuals that are going to be affected. Um, and therefore, penalties, you have to take all that still into consideration, especially if the principle is undergird by some kind of humanism. And you hear me use that word over and over again because it guides me. Sometimes people just get up and say, do I have to pay within a certain period of time? You know, it's almost unrealistic. The only thing that you can be doing is to take, I got to go another stage in order to penalize the person in a severe way simply because they can't pay at this specific time. So I, 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 I really am, I'm, I'm, really, really, I'm really admiring the, the young senator for at least attempting to address um, the humane concerns in the legislation itself. This, this is not a draconian or colonial period where we just um, didn't want to penalize some person. You go to the extreme, you so hang you. You don't hang a man for not having a bicycle belt. You, you have to always be reasonable in your judgments and see how you can apply the, the legislation. And that is why, that is why sometimes they hold a position which is not critical of any specific person. I am equally as loving to that person or any other person when they finish having discussions because it is just reasoning. And I might just, I might just have a style that might be perceived by social types as an aggressive and militant style, but it is probably I am more loving um, than many, person can, many persons can even imagine, sir. Well, I, I really believe I support the, the, the proposal that we have that provision in place that if persons cannot pay the lump sum, we will allow them a reasonable period of time to pay a small installment. Honorable member, none of us in here are able to bear testimony to the best of my knowledge um, of, of the extent of your amorous nature, so we take you at your word. Um, <laughs> the, the, <laughs> the Honorable Leader of the Opposition is suggesting that there may not be much in your reputation <laughs> that substantiates this view that you prof proffer, but that is not germane to this, these, these proceedings. Um, our, 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 I think then we can agree, Deputy Chief Parliamentary Counsel, that we could write into the legisla legislation some provision for these payments to be made by way of installment. Um, and the nature of the installment and so on would have to be determined. I would imagine you will make the appropriate recommendation to us. Now, 
I think then we go to, is it th clause 30 or 31? Clause 30, Chair. 30, okay, so fine. Clause 30 makes provision for challenges to administrative um, penalty um, provision under 28 and 293. Um, sorry, but basically what, what it is making provision to do is that if there is um, an issue with uh, the administration of the administrative penalty, then um, they, that person may appeal to the tribunal in accordance with section 23. And does anyone seek the floor on this matter? I see no hands. Please proceed then to clause 31. Clause 31 speaks to the fact that the, any outstanding administrative penalty constitutes a debt to the Crown and is recoverable in civil proceedings um, before the Magistrates Court. Floor, floor is open, colleagues. administrative penalty to constitute a debt to the Crown and recoverable in civil proceedings before a magistrate's court. Fairly standard, no problem. Part 10, miscellaneous provisions. Um, Chair and Clause 32, mm -hmm. um, the fees collected by the Minister um, responsible for Commerce shall be paid to the, into the consolidated fund. The fees that are collected by the commission, this is the NCC now, shall be retained to the commission and shall constitute the funds of the commission as set out in section 10 of the NCC Act, um, cap 393. Colleagues, are there any requests for the floor? None. Um, let us then proceed to transitional provisions. Clauses 33, 1, and 2. Yes, Chair, um, just as, as an attempt to um, deal with those licenses that would have been issued under the NCCR and the Mar Markets and Slaughterhouses regulations that those um, licenses will be valid for a year after the commencement of the Act. And then in clause, subclause two, then after the expiration of that period referred to in subsection one, the person seeking to operate as a vendor shall then apply for a license to do so under this Act. Fine, grateful to you, ma'am. Are there any requests for the floor? Any interventions proposed under clauses 33-1 and clauses 33 um, sub-clause 2? None. Um, the next three regulations, 34, the minister may make regulations generally to, um, to give effect to this act. We've discussed that myriad times today. 35, a amendment of schedules. And I think the deputy chief has gone through the schedules um, in some detail already. And uh, 36 is consequential amendments which come about as a result of the passage of the Act. Now, there is a matter that I wish to put before the committee. Um, I raised this in the closing, closing um, parts of my first reading speech and I want to be faithful to that which I said to the House. It is my judgment, and I think it is supported by some of the members of the Parliamentary Council of the, the, the Parliamentary Group of the, the um, Governing Party, that we should attempt to use this opportunity to expunge all convictions previously made against the vending community. Um, now, that is a matter about which I seek guidance, CPC, because quite frankly, it was, not, it was not within the contemplation of this bill. I am not sure if it can be done in this bill or if it will have to be done in, an, in, a, 
in a, um, a separate piece of legislation. But first of all, before you advise on how it can be achieved, what I would like to do is to have the views of members of the committee, as opposed to the parliamentary group of the, the Barrios Le Party, the members of the committee, um, what your feelings are about the expunge, about expunging the records of all of those people who have carried criminal convictions for vending prior to today. Floor is open if there are any views. I didn't think it would be, but sure, I, I suspect that the silence is just all of us in total agreement with the position that you have exposed, sir, that we should expunge such records. <laughs> chair, chair, chairman, I am online and my hand was raised. I am sorry. I, I, I am only now seeing it. I beg your pardon, Minister. Thank you very much, Chair. I wish to wholeheartedly endorse the position which you have just uh, put on the table. I, I think that the notion of criminalizing and decriminalizing an activity like vending in the context of this bill is perhaps one of the most seminal things that we could do in addition to providing rights and a framework within which they may operate. And I think perhaps uh, if, if the CPC can, Deputy, Deputy CPC can so guide, uh, I too would be interested in hearing whether or not that is something that can be done as a consequential, a consequential amendment and, and uh, we can go back and treat to that uh, as in as, as at the past and then we would have righted all future wrongs by way of this current legislation so my wholehearted support is thrown behind it surely thank thank you um minister um i have heard sort of okay from the leader of the opposition he has no um objection um senator wiggins you have the floor um, Mr. Chairman, need to be guided by you on the question that I'm asking. Um, if that is a proposal that you are putting forward now, is it possible that um, it can be included in this bill rather than letting this bill go forward as is to be passed and then come back and make an amendment? Because truthfully, that would be a substantial amendment if you intend to expunge all the uh, wrongs, if you want to put it that way, of vendors in the past. So is it possible that it can be added in my simple way? I'm asking that question. No. If it is possible that it can be added to the bill now, rather than passing this and then doing an amendment, which makes it tidier. Your, your, your question is understood, um, and perhaps I had put it badly because that is effectively what I was trying to find out from the committee. First of all, whether you were in, in agreement with the idea, and secondly, the, to invite the Chief Parliamentary Council to, to, to advise us on whether it is possible to do it in this particular piece of legislation or whether we have to adopt a different course. So, um, I'm not sensing that there's any resistance to the idea other than that I see the Honorable Member for St. Michael East wishing no. to take the floor. I cannot imagine that he is objecting. Certainly not, sir. Oh. Um, <laughs> it is not, it's not to be. Why do you <laughs> <laughs> not to be perceived. <laughs> it, is, it is not to be perceived as... Um, just a simple, probably the words don't fully express how important this decision um, by all the members of the committee and parliamentary groups, and I've heard these views expressed as high as the leadership of the institution, and certainly we, we're hearing um, these views being expressed by the leader of the opposition, and many, many other reasonable persons in the general public of Barbados. This, these police, these records. Reasonable people. Reasonable people. Um, the, the reality is, sir, that 
when these criminals, for these minor offenses, um, um, mis misdemeanors, um, many times these, these, these encumbrances serve to stop that person from making any form of mobility in life and not having access to, to work. And, and in, some, in some cases, they, they used to even stamp them in the back of your passport uh, when you were leaving to go overseas and it used to be. And obviously, it wasn't there just for decorative purposes. It used to leave a, a negative stain on the psyche of the individual and stop a lot of persons from um, getting basic jobs. Sometimes when somebody asks for a, a, a police certificate of character, and you just had a, a minor, a minor um, offense. Um, this destroyed the entire livelihood of the, in the entire victim, and I say victim deliberately. So it, 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 it worries me to, to know that we took so long to be able to expunge these records um, of persons who have been accused and to some extent being labeled as though it's a criminal offense. Obviously, if you commit a criminal offense, people see it as a criminal. So I'm glad to know that at least we are, we are taking into consideration, and I hope, that, um, I hope that we can record it in this com committee, and that what is recorded in this committee, whether it is reflected in this piece of legislation or not, that we take it as far as the House of, the House of Assembly, and come to a decision about the urgency of expunging the negative records of persons who are vending and so on. I really, really look forward to seeing that. That would be a very, that's what you call it, uh, what you call it, right? Special day, a glorious day. Or well, what a glorious day it will be. <laughs> what a day that will be. So, so I strongly support it, and I'm sure that all other members share the same view. Fine, thank you, Honorable Member. Um, Deputy Chief Prime Minister Council, um, can you advise, please, as to how we might achieve this? Chair, um, so the pilot ministry was advised that in relation to the procedure for expungement of cr criminal records that is addressed in the Criminal Records Rehabilitation of Offenders Act, Cap 127A. And so, therefore, there, already, there exists already a mechanism for such expungement. But, 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 but how do we get from this point to that? What do, we, what do you advise then that we do? What are the steps that No, but there, there's already a piece of legislation involved. So the, the, the thing is that the persons who have such records may proceed under the um, appropriate legislation as cited. So a mechanism already ex exists providing for expungement. That's what I'm pointing out. Oh, but that would have to be done on an individual basis, case by case basis. Yes, Chair, um, according, to, according to the, you would have to do it in accordance with the, or the existing piece of legislation. Lawyer, chairman, chairman, I have. Uh, but the lead of the opposition had the floor. I, I know your desire to speak, Minister um, Cummins. No, proceed, proceed. I was saying I'm not a lawyer, but but can't you simply write into this legislation um, a reference, a reference which makes a link with the existing legislation? So this properly belongs here. You don't have to rewrite the law, but. At least provide uh, and that is exactly my concern. I, 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 I can't recall from the top of my head where I've seen it, but I am sure that I, I've seen at some stage in the last 20 years this um, a step taken where the legislation on passing on passage then repeals convictions which have taken place before. Chair, but if you have a mechanism that already exists for such expungement, I, I, then I, want, I, want, I want you to try to bear with me, uh, <laughs> Deputy Chief. I, you are thinking purely legally, and I know that you are on good ground legally. There's another dimension to the thinking taking place here, which is a very social dim dimension. What we are trying to do 
is to remove the stigma that um, the Honourable Member for St. Michael East has pointed us to from the, the name of those people who have been given criminal convictions. And what we would like to be able to achieve is with a broad brush, put that whole sordid history, which has been part of Barbados's evolution, put that behind us at one time. There are some people who would have died and gone to the great beyond carrying that burden. They cannot come and clear their names now by a act that they are taking consciously under the Criminal Records Rehabilitation Act. But if we can do this for them, then we have done justice. That's our thinking. So a provision would have to be created to recognize that class of person. That class of person would stretch over different pieces of legislation. So it would include markets and slaughterhouses. It would include NCC. It would include all the relevant enactments to, um, and it would have to be starting from the coming into operation of those enactments. That is the structure that you would be looking for. I think so. And the only thing I could add usefully to that is that even if it was possible to do it before those enactments, but I don't know the legislation under which, but I have an idea of some of the pieces of legislation which they would have been convicted under, but I wouldn't know all of them. But the reality is that where, where our minds are at, if I could speak for the collective, is that we recognize that throughout the annals of the evolution of our history, there have, for since 1700, 1800 and going on, there have been people who've been convicted for this business of vending. And what we would like to do as, as, as robustly as possible is to extinguish, um, expunge all of those records. Now, if it can only be done practically um, with the market slaughterhouse Act and the National Conservation Commission Act, et cetera, well, fine. But um, ideally, we want to be as broad, broad you, and all-encompassing as possible. Chair, you would have to say all, all um, enactments um, touching and concerning, well, you wouldn't say touching and concerning, but touching and concerning the subject of vending. Um, I would be cautious, but um, that's, 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 I, I, I have some All right. reservations. I've given you, I, I, I would like, like you, to add, you to add that to your homework and advise us please on how we can, how we can um, achieve this. So we, we go right back to the 17th century? As far as I'm concerned, we should. Yes. But um, I recognize the challenge legally because there were different pieces of legislation and you can't very easily do it without identifying the, the legislation under which people were convicted. But if the deputy chief is able to, then this is where we will um, spend some time when next we reconvene. Well, or should I give you an extra day? Because we can come back on Friday as well. Uh, Chair, there are several other areas for to prepare for, so I can try to get it done by okay. Friday. No problem. Okay. I'm grateful to you. Uh, for those online, the, the, the Deputy Chief Parliamentary Council has undertaken to try to um, put us in a position by the end of the week to, um, to, to, to have a, a form of words that we might use to achieve this, this um, very important undertaking. Now, Chair, Chair uh, and historic research has been done on a whole set of acts. Um, I, was, I was just asking um, my comrade, because um, he has some knowledge of that. Uh, Professor Beckles, Dr. Beckles has done extensive research on all the acts between 17th century and now, and I think that we we try to capture it uh, by, by making reference to the specific acts that he has recorded. If there are any others, we, research can be done within the next 48 hours, 
so the information can be made available to the deputy. Honorable Leader of the Opposition, the Honorable Member for St. Michael East, I agree with you. Thank you. Sir, I know this that you're intimating. We would like to meet again on Friday. Just wanted to say that's, that's all right with me um, because I recognize there is uh, some timelines attaching to the deliberations of this committee, but there's also some important work of the Public Accounts Committee that we have on hold. So I personally, as Chairman, would want to suggest we, we would accommodate this Friday. We've been using Fridays, but I'm not too sure about the Friday after that. I'm just alerting you. I'm very grateful, um, Honorable Member, um, and, and I, I assure you I would like to be able to be finished yeah, with that yeah. by next Friday. All right. Um, with respect, if you don't mind, you went so quickly on uh, schedule, uh, it's a schedule four, it's part two, Venice license. Um, is there usually uh, an expiry, expiration date attaching to these, indicated on these licenses? This, this has date of issue, but no expiration. Is that normal? I think the, I speak subject to correction, but I believe that the licenses last for a year yeah, well, in each case. So, so the expiration. Should be form indicated. Leave. That's not on the, the form, the black. Wait, assist us, please, honorable member. Which, um, which, which I'm on like page 40. Right? I think it applies to other than page 40, but page 40, and this has to do with the vendor's license. Vending license for vending in op operating on beach, esplanade, etc. cetera. Uh, date of issue is given, but I don't see expiration or expiry. I don't know if that's oh. the normal format. I, 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 I would not want to hazard a guess, but my, <laughs> my gut instinct tells me that if the license is an annual, for an annual okay. renewal, then right. if it is, okay. if no it is issued on the 1st of June, then Just it's valid that. until the 1st of Thank June. Thank you, sir. Or 30th, uh, sorry, 31st page of May. 55, mm -hmm. um, perhaps more substantially. Um, page 55, it has to do with the, as vending zones. At, uh, page 55.4. And I looked through that, and the geography takes me down Roebuck Street, across Country Road, to Baxter's Road, and then left. And I wonder why we would have gone through Country Road, rather than down Roebuck Street, across Pinfold Street, capturing White Park Road, and, um, and those areas at the back of, of the library that bring us back to Baxter's Road. A lot of vending goes on in those areas. Chair? Um, just to just to um, just respond, us, um, the these these particular areas that are cited in part two are directly lifted from the markets and slaughterhouses regulations. So that's why they appear in this form. But so Mr. That's Chairman, where it comes from. point, Mr. Chair. But all I'm saying is a lot of vending takes place beyond Country Road where you turn right to go towards boxes where a lot of vending takes place. I, I think you're missing the point, um, Honorable Lady Opposition. I think that what the Chief Parliamentary Council is saying is that this was lifted from what existed, but there's an abundance of room, including within the, the, the remit of this committee, to broaden the, the, the scope of the zones. Yes, uh, and I am agreeing with you. So, so we will come to that, we will come to that. Um, Senator Cummins, you wanted the floor. Thank you, Chairman. I, through you, I'd like perhaps to request uh, the, the Parliament to provide you with some assistance with regard to those of us who are online. I think I requested the floor some time ago, but uh, without us being physically present, it seems as though we're almost invisible. And so the, the discussion proceeds uh, very quickly, uh, even though we have requested the floor and indicated we wish to speak on a particular matter. So now we're well past where I wanted to intervene. Um, but that notwithstanding, uh, maybe uh, in time for the next meetings, the, 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 the staff from Parliament can assist the Chair uh, with ensuring that uh, those of us who are online are recognized. Chairman, on the question of uh, the point just raised now, since I'm going to abandon my earlier point, since we've now moved on, uh, page four, I just wanted to, to ask a question, uh, a procedural question more so. We've now come to the end of the substantive sections of the legislation and we're now moving into uh, some examination of the schedule. 
uh, we agreed that we were going to have a number of persons who would come in and make submissions. What is the proposal for um, us going back over the actual substantive uh, clauses of the legislation, subject to the interventions of the persons who will be invited to present before the committee? I just wanted to understand where we're going from here. Now we've ended um, our consideration of the last clause in the actual bill. One moment, please, um, Minister. I think, um, I'm not sure if it is related to the, the, the um, opening concerns that you voiced, Minister, but um, I sense that the staff at Parliament would prefer as we go forward to have the background, which is the official background for parliamentary online participation being utilized. Um, does this apply to the Senate? The Senate uses it? The Senate does online? No, we do not. No. Okay. Okay. Right, but I think then that the, that background will have to be accessed by the senators. Okay. So back okay. Not but, chair. But don't, no, 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 I'm coming to you, I'm coming to you, I'm coming to you. I think you may have actually jumped the gun there because we have to deal with this matter now as part of the housekeeping as we go forward. I'm proposing for us to begin, tomorrow, not tomorrow, Wednesday morning at 10 o'clock. Um, and as I understand your question, you, you want to know whether or not we will be going through this substantive legislation again. That is that is correct, Chair. If I'm using the example not, of the Joint not Select Committee the, on... Not, we, I think we'll probably revisit pieces of it, but I don't think we're going to go through it um, clause by clause as we have done. Um, this was for the members of the committee to have their input and so on first. We are now going to come to the stage from Wednesday morning where we will have, I believe we begin with the Barbers Association of Vendors. Um, we will start to take oral evidence from people who are stakeholders and we will also um, deal with the written evidence, for example, that has come from your, your ministry. Um, and mind you, as I, as, let me pause to, to, to ask whether you would wish for a, an officer of your ministry to participate uh, orally as well. Would you? Yes, we can, we can absolutely facilitate okay, that. Okay, fine. Um, the clerk will make the necessary arrangements for that and time and so on. But... Um, the intention then would be that once we come to the oral participation, we would then have the committee, um, if it is that the, the participating entity has submitted something in writing, we will have it distributed beforehand, treat it as being read, and allow for members of the committee to, to um, question those persons who have made their submissions um, in writing in the context of those submissions and also against the backdrop of the legislation because obviously they are writing about their understanding of the legislation. Um, it may be helpful, I think, if people who have done a written submission perhaps uh, be invited to share in a very thumbnail sketch kind of way the type of or the substance of the submission that they are making or that they have made. Um, but I am mindful that for some people that may mean reading through the whole submission and I'm not really minded that we take up a lot of time doing that. I prefer for it to be circulated for members, members read and then if it is that somebody has been a little bit too laborious in their presentation, we just get straight into the questions and get to the pith and substance of what it is all about. Um, if that satisfies your question, then the next issue for me would be how we deal with the Wednesday morning and Friday, because I'm looking at us meeting at 10 o'clock on Friday as well. My proposal at this stage will be to begin with Barvin. I am not sure how many people will make submissions under the umbrella of Barvin, but I think that we could adequately deal with them between 10 a.m. if we start punctually and lunchtime on Wednesday morning. In the afternoon, I know that we already have um, Ambassador Commisson has made a submission. He's, he's made a submission and he's made a request 
to have an oral presentation. And I look forward to the contribution from Ambassador Commisson and, um, and um, the Honorable Member for St. Michael East. Yes. Yeah, we will reach out to, to Ambassador Commisson to find out whether he's able to do it on Wednesday. In the event that he cannot, I would want to suggest, Minister Cummins, that you have your people from the BTMI on standby, that they could do it on Wednesday afternoon. And that probably would be, I, I think we could use the times we use today. So let us say from uh, quarter to two onwards. Um, ideally, we should be finishing by 3.30. We have gone a little bit past that this afternoon. All right. Um, now, there is another association of vendors. I do not want to presume that Barvin speaks for everybody. Um, I'm trying to remember the, the name of the, the, the other association. We aside. Yes, we say vendors. Um, and I would want to make assurance doubly sure. I know we've reached out to Barvin. Have we reached out to the Wayside Vendors Association? If not, we must do so, please. Um, at the soonest possible opportunity. Now, Mr. Clark, are there any other submissions that have come in thus far that we can then try to not as yet? All right, fine. Well, I don't know that there's much more that we can go at, do at this stage. Um, Senator Wiggins, your hand is up. As a, up for, for a new intervention or from before? Um, things, um, hold, keep your powder dry. Hold on, Clark, Mr. Clark. Mm -hmm. Okay. The intention is that when Barvin does their presentation, we will have them in the committee room and they will be um, streamed live into this room. With, with me? So as to facilitate the social distancing requirements and so on. Just like what happened in estimates. I presume that the senators will be familiar with that. But effectively, the committee room is just across the room from where we are. So they will be seated over there. They will say what they have to say, and we can ask them. We can interface with them from over here. Um, Chair, just a concern in relation to the practicality of making the amendments necessary for Friday. If we're having the extra session on Wednesday, it does create some no, I, I understand that you will not have all the amendments ready. I understand that. We're just keeping a record of things suggested and so on. We, the, committee, the committee still has a little bit of life left in it yet. Um, Senator Wiggins, floor is yours. Yes. Please proceed. Thank you. I was only saying um, that in terms of Barvin, I think that we probably would have to allocate a whole day for them, both Barvin and the Association of the Side Vendors, because they are like one of the most important stakeholders in this entire exercise. And just to limit them to two hours um, essentially might not be enough. So I would think that on Wednesday, we could um, dedicate that time to both um, association of vendors. And secondly, on page 40, um, the same, um, where the minister signed at the end of the um the vending license it has the minister responsible for public markets and the minister responsible for fisheries so um i don't know if you want to say specifically the minister responsible for agriculture and then the minister responsible for fisheries and public markets which could be one and the same so we just want, so there will be a little bit of duplication there on page 40. Um, well, it, it is actually, it is, it is structured to reflect the current arrangements, but your point is taken. It may not always be this way. Um, with respect to, 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 the, to the vending association, I, I, I hear you and I agree with you, Senator. The fact of the matter is that um, my judgment was that we give them the first bite of the cherry, um, 
if it is felt by lunchtime on Wednesday that there is uh, a, a desire for them to have further contribution, that can be accommodated. I'm just trying to manage the, the day as best as possible because equally, you may find that um, there are so much in agreement with that which is put before the subcommittee that it, there are no challenges. It is for us to, to, to by way of our explor exploratory questioning, find out whether there are any um, adjustments or amendments to the legislation that are desirable. Um, are there any other requests for the floor? No? Honorable Lady the Opposition. Oh, the Honorable Lady of the Opposition wants to make a motion to adjourn. That is seconded by Minister Humphrey. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. We are adjourned 10 o'clock on Wednesday morning. Could we please be as prompt as possible because that way we will be able to get through the business of the day. dive with Marvin, we will do so. <coughs> Don't worry about that. But we may not do so on Wednesday. Precisely. They can, be, they, can be, they can come back. Same thing with the other yeah. association. Grateful to you all.